Well, good morning, everybody. You know, I'd like to start everything on time. This is blowing us away. And maybe this is what we can expect as we had to give up the fellowship hall. And we're just going to have to be very friendly for a few months, okay? Because we only have this space and the great room for these, these sorts of events. So moving right along, I think most of you know our good friend and fellow resident, Fred Beck. Yay. And he's very gracious. Oh, by the way, for those of you uh, who want to give up a seat or don't want to stay, this is being live streamed and recorded. So you don't have to be in here crushed together uh, if you don't want to. OK? So Fred Beck, Fred, how long have you lived at Cedarfield now? Just about six years. Six years. Well, it says here, it says here, Fred holds a doctorate in history from Georgetown. He retired after 31 years from the federal government as a historian, and he ended his career as editor and publisher of the U.S. Air Force History Program. What does that mean? We printed and uh, history books for the library shelves of America. That's pretty much it. Yeah, we, we were a small publishing house, and I was the boss. Can we can we get those books down in our library? Uh, yes, I think they're not copyrighted. None of, none of them is copyrighted, okay. so they're easily accessible, and they're also available online. You can read them online if you don't want to buy anything. Can you anything talk like into the mic? Yes. Oh, okay. You can you can buy them or you can read them online. You don't have to buy them on uh, from the Air Force, but uh, they're printed uh, at government expense and are free to anyone who who wants to read them online. They still do cost something if you are going online to buy the book. So anyway, that's that's my contribution. So here's the question: How did it happen? that you became an expert in this particular subject? Uh, well, it's a matter of my interest in uh, the, 20th, the violent 20th, 20th century in the first place, uh, and the whole history of how the world came to form itself after the Second World War in the, in the defeat of a Nazi regime in Germany and uh, another Axis government in Japan. All of this has always interested me, and it was my focus uh, as a major at Georgetown University. So that's where I come in. And I hope I can make some of this intelligible to you today. Take it away, Fred. Okay, here we go. <laughs> and we'll first get this thing even larger. There we go. All right. Ready, in? Okay. To start with, we need to explain what, what is Kristallnacht. It's a German word which translates as crystal night, but more figuratively, uh, it translates as the night of broken glass. And we will see the reason for that as the, uh, as the um, uh, presentation uh, moves on. It starts with some examination of uh, what Jewish life in Germany was like in the mid 20th century. Uh, the census figure of 1932-33 uh, counted only 525,000 uh, registered Jews in a population of just under 80 million in Germany. Uh, by 1939, this then included uh, Austria and various occupied areas uh, in, in Europe. Uh, there were great families who contributed great wealth and national service, uh, and among them the, the Warburg family, which was a great banking house. Uh, Albert Balling uh, founded the Hamburg America Shipping Line and uh, was uh, a noted patron of the arts uh, within the country. A number of other people who were uh, uh, prominent in their day were Jewish in origin, but none of them had as much fame and even notoriety as this man, Walter Rathenau, who was the uh, German foreign minister in 1922. Uh, for his troubles in uh, regularizing uh, uh, relations
relations between Germany and the Soviet Union, the new communist state. Uh, he was highly unpopular for that one act, and for his troubles, he was assassinated in June of that year. Uh, the, the collection of uh, major contributory uh, Jewish figures invented for the Kaiser, a category of Jews known as the Kaiser Youth, Kaiser Jews, those who had contributed something to the state. He kind of adopted them as sons, and it was a r ridiculous patronizing attitude uh, that he practiced where this minority was concerned. So 14,000 Jews served in the German army in World War I, and uh, any number received the highest combat decoration, the, the uh, Iron Cross for their service and sacrifice in the war. Residual anti-Semitism continued, uh, as it always had in, in, in German life. In the army, you could, be, uh, you could have a Jewish wife and be a member of the general staff, but you could, not, could never accede to the idea of being the chief of the general staff, and promotions were always limited. Let's move right on here. As Hitler uh, arrives in power, and he was, he was handed power, he did not seize it, he did not conduct a revolution. He was given power simply because the Nazi party had become the largest one in the German parliament of the day. And the, uh, the power brokers uh, in Germany thought they could control Hitler once he became the chancellor, but this proved to be a vain hope. Uh, the first thing that they did, the Nazis staged a, a fire in the, in the German parliament, burned the place down, or burned the interior of it to the point it was useless. They blamed this on the communists, and on the basis of the threat from outside, or political elements that they condemned, uh, the, the, the parliament, or what was left of it, uh, meeting in an opera house, uh, proclaimed uh, that Hitler now had the right to rule by decree. They did not uh, legislate law anymore, but whatever Hitler said was to be the law, his, his word became the, the law of the land. And as such, he uh, exacted uh, a policy of anti-Semitism, that is the exclusion of all Jewish elements from German national life. Uh, did this by declaring, for instance, a boycott of all Jewish commerce, small shops, and, and larger uh, enterprises on the 1st of April, 1933. And it continued, the policy continued uh, with, with the so-called uh, law for the reestablishment of the professional civil, civil service, which came, contained within it something called the Aryan paragraph. You couldn't work for the German government, or that is, be a civil servant, if you were even uh, some, some part of you, so your heritage was in fact Jewish. If you had a Jewish grandfather, that eliminated you. And, and the odd thing that, that this policy uh, exacted on German life was that many pastors in, in uh, German Protestant churches who had converted to Christianity were now, in fact, out of a job because in Germany, pastors of local churches are paid for by the government. They received a salary from the government, and as such, they were civil servants. This law prevented them from receiving any kind of a salary, and so they had to leave the church. Uh, there was a joke that passed around, or a bit of comment at any rate, that passed around in that day that the figure that was on the crucifix in most churches now had to come down from where he was and leave the church because he was, after all, a Jew. So this, this was one of the uh, rather uh, trenchant commentaries on how things uh, progressed to this point. The Nuremberg rally uh, in 1935 was also the occasion for the passage of two new laws that Hitler simply proclaimed uh, on his own authority. One was the protection of German blood, which meant that uh, no German could legitimately have any kind of uh, relationships, physical relationships, with a Jewish person, uh, whether it worked male, female, or female, male, didn't matter. And the second, the Reich citizenship law reduced uh, Jewish uh, status within the country uh, to only being, uh, you were only now not a citizen, but only a subject. You did not have rights. 
And what the what these pictures uh, designate here on the lower right is what happened in, in Jew, uh, Jewish shops all over Germany were plastered with these kind of signs that warned any Jewish shopper from entering the, the store to buy anything at a Jewish concern. The, the Nuremberg rally, the, uh, the, the, the mass of soldiery that you see in the, in the lower left uh, was an indication of just how far the, the German army had expanded in only seven months uh, after conscription was again declared. What this meant for one particular element within German society of the day, at the end of World War I, uh, the victorious Allied powers resurrected what was an old Polish state. And that state had a great uh, deal of difficulty in trying to make uh, a clear policy uh, for the, the varieties of people all over Europe that were born originally in what was Polish territory, but which had been which had been owned and governed by various other nationalities, including the German one. There were some 50,000 uh, Poles inside of Germany before World War I, but once the, the war was over and the, the national lines were redrawn, uh, these Poles were now inside of Germany, and uh, that number included 17,000 Jews. In October of 1938, uh, the passport system that, that had existed, uh, the P Polish government had issued passports to all of these uh, Jews now living in Germany. But uh, in October of 1938, the Polish government decided that if you had not renewed that passport within the last five years, uh, your passport had expired. Now this meant that any number of Jews living in Germany were now stateless citizens. And what the German government did uh, was to simply declare that all of these people were going to be exported, simply deported, to, to required to leave the country. This affected, in particular, one family living in Hanover, the, uh, the family of Zundel uh, Grinchmann, who was a mere humble tailor in that city, who, with his wife, his wife Rivka, uh, ran this uh, minimal business on the streets of the city and they had between them some five children. Uh, this proved to be a real problem because the family was fairly poverty stricken, as you might imagine, trying to make a go out of a minor tailoring business. So uh, the revisions to the passport policy meant that in October 1938, all of these now stateless Jews, 17,000 of them, but some 14,000 were, were basically affected by the next German policy, which was simply to deport these people and throw them over the border at, a, at the Polish city at Zbazin on, on the 27th and 28th of October of that year. And the picture here is a scene of these now uh, dispossessed people thrown over the border into Poland. And the, the argument continued because the Polish government did not want them either. Uh, finally, the issue was settled and, and Poland did accept this number of, of people. So they were now efficiently uh, uh, made Polish citizens instead of German, one, uh, German ones where their citizenship had been denied them. All of this comes to a head with uh, in the, the uh, experience of one young man by the name of Herschel Feibel Grunschmann, the son of of Zundel and Rivka in Hanover. They were poor enough that they had to send their youngest son, who's Herschel, uh, in 1936, they, they set him uh, on a journey to first to Belgium, where he was supposed to find some kind of relatives. By the following uh, year, he had made it to Paris in France, where he, he, where he had an uncle and aunt, also running a, a humble tailor business. His, uh, his difficulties in French society were severe because he had no papers. He was not legitimately allowed to hold a job and pay taxes within the state, and so he was there equally a stateless person uh, living uh, illegally to a certain extent within, within the country of France. Uh, a great deal of tension 
prevail between his uncle and aunt and, and the rest of the family in, uh, in uh, Paris at this time. Uh, this is interrupted one day when a postcard arrives from, from Herschel's older sister, Berta, who is among the families that had been deported in, into Zbazin across the Polish border. And he is highly incensed at this. Uh, always a sickly young lad, he was also a, a very smart fellow. Uh, some commentary <coughs> in, uh, 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 speculates on the idea that he may have been uh, the victim of, uh, of some uh, mental problems uh, or autism that left him high functioning, but he was always bullied in school and uh, was c kind of a, a ne'er-do-well on the streets of Paris who, with, a, with a bunch of other young French lads, often attended the cinema during the day and had nothing else to do. He got meals uh, handed to him on occasion because he would go to, the, uh, to a local restaurant uh, called Tuva Bien, which means all goes well. Uh, and for sweeping the floors and whatnot, that restaurant would give him an occasional meal. So this was the state of the fellow. But once he gets this postcard with the news of what's happening to his family, uh, he, he has a mighty argument with his uncle one evening on the 6th of November of 1938, and he decides to do something about this. So he spends a night in, the, in a local hotel and the following day goes to a uh, hardware store which sold knives and cutlery for kitchen use, but it had a small sideline in uh, a limited number of handguns. Uh, Herschel went to the, to the store with the intention of buying the biggest handgun that he could find, a Colt 45 like he had seen in the, in the movies from America. And the local owner told him, look, if you're going to carry something around in your pocket, you don't want something that big. So he sold Herschel a five-shot revolver, 25 bullets, a hammerless gun that he could easily carry in his pocket. So he takes this for 275 francs, and it was supposed to report immediately to the local police station for the fact that he now owned a firearm, that he was going to help his uncle uh, protect the cash uh, income for the tailor shop. Instead of going to the police uh, station, he made directly his way to the German embassy at number 78 Rue Lille, where his intent was to exercise that revolver against somebody, hopefully the German ambassador whose picture shows up on the right here. Veljek, this ambassador, uh, on that morning of uh, November 7th, did what he usually did. At 9 o'clock in the morning, he, he departed the embassy and, and went out for his daily walk in Paris. He loved to walk around the city. Who wouldn't? Great place. But uh, in other words, Herschel missed the ambassador. So he came in the door uh, after talking his way past the French police squad on the sidewalk outside and they were there to prevent demonstrations against Nazi Germany from getting too lively on the streets of Paris. So he had to, had to talk first to the French police outside, then to a concession stand at, on the ground floor of the German embassy to explain what he was there for. And he told the, the, the uh, uh, receptionist there that I have a document I want to give to, uh, to somebody in the embassy. So the, the receptionist sent him up a flight of stairs to the first office on the, at the top of the stairs and told him to wait there because he was going to be uh, dealing with oops, this young fellow, Ernst von Roth, 29-year-old old legation secretary, one of, the, one of the lowest of the low in the, in the German foreign policy, foreign civil service. He was usually required to handle the, the odds and, and ends of things that happened on the Paris streets that affected German interests. So from Rath was not in his office, Herschel went up the stairs into, the, into that office and sat down in a chair, a stuffed chair opposite the desk. Uh, from Rath entered the room, went, went to take his seat behind the desk when Herschel pulled his hammerless five-shot revolver from, from his pocket and proceeded to blaze away at Ernst von Rath. 
uh, after sh five shots, uh, he managed to hit uh, this German diplomat with only two of them. One of them had struck him in the chest and uh, managed to, to uh, lodge in his, his upper shoulder, his left shoulder. The last shot managed to penetrate his abdomen, uh, shattered his spleen, and then uh, tore up his pancreas and lodged in, in his stomach. It took two days for, for Marath to die after they hauled him out off to the uh, Clinique de Alma in Paris, uh, where he was attended by a number of French doctors, two jo doctors sent by Hitler himself to attempt to save his life, and a number of blood transfusions that in involved uh, French citizens, including war veterans who had done any number of the, these acts in the past. They stood up and gave their blood to this German uh, shooting victim. So, but the, uh, the, none of the efforts and the transfusions could save the man's life. The, the damage to his, uh, to his pancreas was, was what eventually killed him. Herschel is uh, handed over by the embassy staff to that same group of policemen on the, on the sidewalk outside, and he is eventually driven away. Amazing how, how much coverage, for press coverage there is of these incidents, and here he is in the car being, being hauled off uh, after being arraigned. And uh, the events begin to take their, their toll uh, ever after this. The, the Reich itself, after, after von Roth's death, uh, Hitler is in Munich and, and, is just, and decides with Goering and Goebbels the two people who are uh, uh, illustrated on the, on the left side of the, of the screen here. The brown shirts were all assembled in, in various great cities all over Germany at this time for the simple reason, an accidental reason, that it was the 15th anniversary of the Beer Hall Putsch in November of 1923, where Hitler attempted to overthrow the Bavarian state government and failed to do so and spent four years in prison after that. But this is the reason they were all assembled with their uh, spiffy brown uniforms on to march about the streets of the major cities of Germany in, in uh, demonstrations in favor of the Nazi government. Murder and mayhem ensues. Some 91 German Jews were murdered outright. Some 600 of these people all over the country simply committed suicide, knowing that uh, this, this was the, uh, the program that was about to be exacted against them. Uh, 2,500 temples, synagogues, were torched, as you see in the lower right-hand picture, the one in Magdeburg, and uh, some 7,500 stores were uh, <coughs> just pillaged, in the, in the, as in the picture you see in the upper right. Uh, shop windows were smashed and the glass fell all over the sidewalks outside which in the evening hours reflected the light and looked like crystal. That's where the name comes from, Crystal Night. And uh, after one and a half days, over, over two calendar days, uh, the, the rampage was suddenly halted. Uh, in an odd kind of uh, exercise of Nazi justice, uh, the, uh, the, the, the stormtroopers were prevented from any further uh, depredations against the Jewish population, especially the, 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 the spoliation of Jewish women. Uh, any item that had been stolen from a Jewish home at this point had to be surrendered to state authorities. And more than that, if, a, if an SA stormtrooper raped a Jewish woman, he, he was convicted of having committed race despoiliation, race shame, for having had sexual relations with a, a Jewish person. He was immediately stripped of his uniform and uh, sent out of the, uh, kicked out of the SA. So the, at the same time, Goering, the, the loudmouth at the top picture on the left, levied a fine of one billion Reichsmarks against uh, all the citizens, or uh, Jewish citizens, or uh, they weren't citizens, they were merely subjects now, of the entire country, a billion Reichsmarks, and furthermore, uh, no insurance company was permitted to make good on the damages to all the Jewish shops 
and properties all over the you know, Reich at this time. So on the 17th of November, the family of von Roth holds a funeral in Dusseldorf, where the family was from. Uh, Hitler and uh, the foreign minister Ribbentrop attend this this uh, uh, obsequy, this this uh, uh, marking of von Roth's passing. But they, but neither of them ever says a word of sympathy to the von Roth family. In the meantime, it had been discovered that the family was not exactly as zealous as they should have been in the Nazi cause. And so they were kind of snubbed, even at the funeral of their own son. And yet this was the beginning of uh, a rather uh, con concentrated effort by the uh, German government to, to, to start a test case, that is a, uh, a show trial, which was supposed to prove that there was murder in, murderous intent by international Jews in a conspiracy against the, the, the world and the, the Third Reich in particular. As this all progresses, a French jurist by the name of Vincent de Moro Giafferi steps up and says he will defend Herschel Grunspan for this crime that has been committed. Once uh, Fomrath dies, uh, even under French law, he is uh, Herschel is being charged with second-degree murder and therefore is subject to a death penalty or something as dire under French law. Uh, the extent of the case is, is uh, it, uh, uh, reaches also to the aunt and uncle who took in Herschel in Paris uh, because uh, that what they did was technically illegal. They harbored a, a, not a fugitive but an illegal resident and they kept him fed or at least looked after. So Morrow takes this, this case on. He is one of the great uh, legal figures in, in France of the day and a brilliant lawyer. Uh, the, the term good lawyering uh, ha has uh, a, a greater meaning here because as he begins to construct his defense of Herschel Grinchman, what he promotes and proposes is that uh, this murder was the result of a, of a love affair gone wrong. That von Roth was in fact a homosexual who had had a relationship with young Herschel Grunschmann and that it had resulted in a falling out that came to the murder by Herschel of von Roth. Well, this is highly, highly fictional, but uh, Morrow decided to use this particular uh, narrative as part of his case for the simple reason that in French law uh, there's a great deal of, uh, of uh, 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 great deal of way, way to uh, expand on a legal case uh, because in, in French law there is a great deal of uh, um, help for the crime of passion uh, anyone who was involved in a lover's triangle or something, when they come to a, uh, an action at law, th uh, this is treated more leniently than most uh, simple acts of predi uh, in, in predicated murder. Uh, the, the problem, of course, with it, Herschel himself wanted nothing to do with a narrative like this. He knew very little of what human relations or homosexual relations might have been, but he understood it meant something to, as a, uh, making something blameworthy of his own character. So he, at the beginning, at any rate, he winds up resisting the, the, the whole defense that Morrow presents. Uh, the, the case was still being uh, processed and entered and, and uh, working its way through the court system when the Germans invade uh, Western Europe, starting in, ne in the Netherlands, and they reach Paris by June 14, 1940. And there begins here al an almost comical uh, conclusion to, to Herschel's case, but one that ends with his life uh, uh, sacrificed in some, in some manner. He winds up in the great French uh, prison at Fresnes. Uh, which is southeast of Paris. There's some 1,200 cells there, and all manner of prisoners uh, were, were locked up in, uh, in the place with 
with Herschel, either in the mugshot that uh, he uh, was registered under in the prison. Uh, as the Germans begin to arrive and threaten to take the city of Paris itself, the murders and the authorities within the prison realize that any number of political prisoners uh, within this establishment here at Fren are in great danger if they uh, wind up being captured or seized by German authority, occupation authorities. What happens is they release all these prisoners, especially Herschel Grunschmann, whom they knew was going to be victimized by the, the new conquerors. Uh, this leads to a chaotic escape uh, in, in a group of six prisoners led by a warder who was supposed to control them, but they, wait, they wind up getting down to the French city of Orléans in, in more southern France, where Herschel is pictured He's actually banging on the door of the prison to be let in, not to be let out. But, but the inside of a prison is the one place where he could feel safe. So uh, once the French uh, uh, nation is subdued by the, the German conquerors in June and July 1940, and the Vichy regime is set up, it's part and parcel of Vichy's obligations that is subject to German authority to surrender anyone that they, they deem to be a political risk, and Herschel Grunspan's name tops the list. So on, in July, on the 20th of July, uh, the Vichy regime hands, <coughs> hands Herschel over to the, to the Gestapo, and he's transported to Germany. The last place that we know of, of that he has an extended existence is at the concentration camp in Sachsenhausen, north of Berlin. And the Germans have a number of people uh, assigned to the idea of producing this show trial, uh, which again, it has uh, for its purpose, uh, demonstrating that there is an international Jewish conspiracy, uh, which of course doesn't exist. But by the time in 1942, when this, uh, the preparation for this trial is going on, uh, the Germans had more than enough uh, trouble on their hands in trying to defeat uh, the Soviet Union and that they are at war with the rest of the world. So in December of 1942 is the last time we have any indication of the whereabouts of Herschel and his end, his, his uh, ultimate fate is still to this day a mystery. As things progress uh, in international relations, uh, it says here unique behavior by the United States because the, the, the American authority, the administration under F uh, Franklin Roosevelt uh, makes a, a rapid decision on the 11th of November, two days after Forrath died, to withdraw the, the American official uh, relation, uh, 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 official inside the city of Berlin. So Hugh Wilson is recalled, the ambassador is recalled, and diplomatic protocol requires that the German ambassador in Washington also has to be recalled. So the other two places are taken by the people at the lower uh, levels of the, uh, of the screen here. On the American side, Alexander Kirk, uh, one of the more colorful foreign service officers ever to serve in the State Department, uh, takes the place of Hugh Wilson. And Hans Thompson, who was something of a resistor to the Nazi regime himself, uh, continues to represent German interests in Washington, D.C. The, the, the American government was the only one that did this, that withdrew its uh, diplomatic personnel, the senior diplomatic person within the country, within uh, Germany. No other country, country withdrew its, its senior diplomat. So to sum up on all of this, which, as it says here, what we experience is a radical and spasmodic expansion of anti-Semitism as a, as a national policy. And it was the first of, of several uh, uh, events that, that we count as the, begin, the beginning, the precursors to uh, the more uh, dire uh, events in the Holocaust, which eventually sacrificed some six million Jews uh, to the uh, governing policy of the uh, 
of the national government in Germany. But there's no context to all of this, and perhaps we can consider that. Uh, Herschel's murder of Fograth of, of was actually the second violent action uh, in which a German, uh, not a diplomat, but a local uh, organizer of Nazi affairs in Switzerland was actually killed by a Jewish uh, individual. In that case, in February 1936, uh, uh, this fellow, uh, Wilhelm Gustloff by name, in Davos, Switzerland, uh, was shot by a, a, a Croatian, a Jewish Croatian medical student. He was tried and, and convicted and kept in prison in Switzerland until after World War II. He was then released and he migrated to Switzerland, to uh, Israel, uh, where he died uh, in, in 1980. So this, this is one bit of history in, in that uh, regard that uh, we add to the to the whole history of the Holocaust that, uh, in, in this era. The EVM conference was, was organized and uh, staffed by Franklin Roosevelt in July 1938. Some 32 countries were invited to, to send uh, representatives and do something about the, the violations against Jewish uh, personnel inside of Germany. All of them, the representatives, representatives all lamented how bad and sad, illegal all of this development was inside Germany, but none of them stood up to the idea that they should take in uh, refugees from, from Germany and add them to their own population. Uh, the following year uh, saw the voyage of the, the St. Louis, which is famous in Holocaust uh, uh, legend and lore. Uh, the ship left Hamburg in May uh, for Cuba, which was supposed to be a, a refuge where uh, 970 some Jews could reside until their, their entry visas were, were processed to let them get into the United States. Uh, Cuba refused to let them land, and the ship had to go back to Europe, uh, landing by the 17th of June where they did not go to, to Germany, but they landed in, in, uh, uh, in, in uh, Belgium, which did take them in where eventually many of them did escape, but also many of those same victims that showed up on that voyage of the St. Louis were later captured and treated to uh, Nazi uh, justice in, in, the, in the later events of the war as uh, German uh, force extended all the way to uh, to France, to uh, uh, Norway, to, and to the east in, in Europe. Uh, no, at no time did, was there a vote to change the, uh, the quotas that, that uh, kept uh, the movement of uh, Europeans in various numbers. Uh, e each country had a number to, that, that it could not exceed. Uh, when people were trying to move from uh, that nation to the shores of the United States. And in, in terms of uh, this restriction, uh, Germany and Austria by 1939 uh, had a, a maximum number of only some 27,000 people. Uh, the, there was a children transport in Britain which took, finally, in 1939, took 10,000 of these uh, Jewish children who were simply transported, left their parents, and went to Britain, uh, where they were accepted and farmed out to uh, foster parents with, within the country. A, an immigration bill uh, was proposed in the Congress, the, the Bradner Rogers Bill, which would have accepted 20,000 more of these Jewish children, particularly children. The bill died in committee. It was never voted on. So this is where it was left. But at the same time, uh, the popular opinion in uh, the United States split itself uh, left and right, uh, the right wing being represented, uh, represented by none other than the great hero of aviation, uh, Charles Lindbergh, and the America First Committee, and a Roman Catholic priest who preached out of Chicago uh, all manner of anti-Semitic bile over the radio, and he had he had a 
uh, following that represented perhaps a third of the, of the American population uh, at the time. So uh, the, the isolationist attitudes within the states uh, were firmly set by this kind of attitude. But at the same time, there was a very famous uh, American uh, woman journalist by the name of uh, Dorothy Thompson, whose radio hour held an equal amount of influence uh, among American listeners. And in her day, she raised $40,000 to contribute to the trial, or uh, to Morrow's uh, management of the trial against uh, Herschel Grimshaw. That $40,000 in 1939 would amount to something like 875000 today. So there was some uh, reaction by people who saw a certain amount of justice in, in contributing to getting Herschel Grinchbahn off, uh, get, meet the charges that he was met, met with in, in French courts. Now, there's an end to the story, and uh, we start here with the picture of that bad boy, Adolf Eichmann, who in, in the Gestapo's uh, organization was in charge of the, the office that planned and executed all the deportations of French Jews uh, from all over Europe, first in Germany and then from the occupied areas. The man did not kill anybody, but he certainly sent millions of people to their deaths. And he was pursued after the war because he, like so many German and other war criminals, had escaped to South America, in this case to Argentina. Uh, he was pursued there by the Mossad, returned to now Israel, the state of Israel, in 1960. In 61, he was tried and convicted uh, and eventually hanged on the, May, the 31st of May, 1962. This is what he looked like in the dock. And you can still see on the left side of his mouth a sort of a nervous tick that has him pulling that side of his face in a, in a very distinctive pattern. Uh, so the question now is, who's that fellow on the other side? Uh, that is Zunga Grunschmann, and who is Zunga? Zunga was Herschel's father. Herschel, uh, who was lost forever to memory, his father, however, uh, when he was thrown over the, the Polish border in October 1938 with the rest of his family, managed to get back to Radom, which was the city of his birth. When the Second World War starts, the Germans take the western half of Poland and the Soviets, the Russian, the Red Army, grab the eastern half. Zunder managed to get from the German-occupied side of Poland to the Russian-occupied side. And he survives World War II, although many of his children did not. Uh, he managed to migrate in 1948 uh, to the new state of Israel. And when he's there, uh, when, I, when Eichmann is captured and brought to Jerusalem for trial, one of the first people to stand up and witness against him, and here he is doing that, just that, is Zunder Grunschmann. He died there in Haifa in 1978, so there's some form or some bit of eventual resolution of the Grunschmann story, and his father himself stood up to give witness uh, against uh, Eichmann. And that is where the story rather ends itself at this point, Although the, the, the legacy of the Kristallnacht is still with us, we still use that term uh, to you know, commemorate the event, but we mark the occasion as one of the great events where uh, man's inhumanity to man uh, is more than evident. So with that, we'll let it go. All right. Remarks, ideas, 
statements. What would you like to ask a resident professor? <laughs> I have a question, of course. Okay. When did the United States change their attitude out about the quota system? Yeah, uh, yeah a good question. It's only after World War II that uh, any number of refugees, displaced persons, became the new designation for people who were now homeless because of the events of the Second World War. Uh, and I don't have an exact date for when the attitude changed or when the law changed, but in the post-war period, some 120,000 uh, displaced persons, most of them being Jews, uh, migrated and found their way eventually to the United States, or at least to the Western Hemisphere. So, uh, yeah, that, that would take a bit more research to, to give you a, a, a strict answer, a date. Yeah. You mentioned uh, America pulled its ambassadors out of Germany. I read a book, The Garden of the Beast, and it was, a, it was about the ambassador. Did we have an ambassador later, up until we declared war, they declared war in Germany? No, uh, the, the ambassador you're talking about is Thomas Dodd. And uh, he's regarded as a, a very controversial sort, uh, accommodating to the point that he said he was he was a living uh, sermon in, um, in democracy, uh, living in Berlin, where autocracy had now prevailed. And Dodd was regarded as having been uh, something of a failure. Uh, he, uh, Hugh Wilson followed Dodd in the office. Uh, and there was no ambassador after uh, uh, November 11th, 1938, when we, when we withdrew. Uh, the official representat representation of an ambassador. That rank it was no longer in existence until after the war. Uh, and, and I think 1955, because uh, German sovereignty is not returned to that country until that year. And the reason for it is, by this point, the Cold War is, is uh, definitely upon us, and we need uh, we need to do something about regularizing the political relations with Germany. So at that point, German sovereignty, that is the right to have its own government and to administer its own company, uh, country, uh, was finally uh, returned to, to the German nation. But it was only half of it because you had East Germany now and West Germany. So, uh, but that's, that's the sequence of events as it goes. Fred? Yeah? I mentioned that Ambassador Dodd was a professor of history. He was a history professor, exactly. It, I think to uh, Randolph Macon. Yes. Yeah. Going, going back to the spring of 32, when the uh, National Socialist Party won the election, Right. And then within two or three months, they were doing all this destruction of society. Um, it, it just seemed like they had to be inf infiltrating German society well before that in order to have such a major influence in such a quick time. Yeah, it, it's, so the question, how did they do this, or how, what's yeah, the explanation yeah, for that? Yeah. Uh, how did they get started, and how did they build yeah. such a, a force so quickly? Yeah, the, the party starts as, as a formal German political party, uh, of which there were 36 uh, in, in this period, or without stripes from, from uh, radical right to radical left. Uh, uh, and Hitler's, Hitler's uh, party card was number seven. So, so the, the, the party starts right after World War I, and the, one of the great uh, uh, motivations
attitudes is, is the attitudes of the German population at the, the defeat in World War I and the shame that this, this seemed to uh, visit upon the German population. It's a great upsurge, particularly in southern Germany, uh, in Bavaria, uh, for right-wing parties. And uh, the, the Nazi party manages to take advantage to, to have a great, uh, great uh, deal of this popular opinion. Uh, they also, uh, uh, what they do is, is uh, almost daily, they, they conduct these marches in the streets and uh, physical assaults against anyone who's declared to be an opponent. Uh, so they, they manage to uh, exert a great deal of force against their, uh, their uh, uh, opposites in the political uh, uh, scheme in, in the day. Uh, but but they, they, their fate goes up and down as, as German econ economy improves after the uh, in the crash of 1929, uh, they managed to, to, for very briefly, they managed to improve the position of their uh, of, of the party. Uh, by 1932, as you're saying, they, they are the largest party in the Reichstag, and the, the president of Germany, old old, Reichsmar old Marshal Hindenburg, decides uh, or is advised that he would best be best served by at least making Hitler the chancellor, because as chancellor, uh, he would be he would be subject to certain laws that would limit his powers. Uh, and this proved to be, as I said, a, a, f a faint, faint hope uh, of being able to control the man. Uh, what he did was exact uh, his his program mainly by force, by police authority once he gained control of the interior ministries and could uh, exact uh, police uh, action against anyone who opposed him. So in one case, the, uh, the German center party, the Catholic party in Germany, it, absolved, it, it dissolved itself in, in deference to Hitler. And uh, this was uh, an act of political suicide, but it, it did do that in July 1933 after it gained power. So uh, the, this is a subject that could uh, involve us in another week-long seminar as, as to how the Nazis gained, uh, exacted their, their power and imposed themselves uh, down to the lowest village level. Uh, so uh, they, they did this largely by, uh, they had a system of so-called walk marks uh, uh, like an apartment size or a regional city block, uh, each of these each of these uh, geographic areas had a political officer within that uh, that area that would report uh, periodically on the success of the of the government in imposing its will on the rest of the country. Uh, it, it was eventually a successful idea. Uh, once war with the, with the Russians, with the Soviet Union, uh, ensued, uh, a great many Germans, uh, uh, out of fear of what was coming from the East, uh, supported the government in any case, and, uh, and, and kept, uh, kept their mouths shut as far as uh, resistance is concerned. It's a long answer to a short question. So. <laughs> Well, Fred, thank you very, very much. We've all learned something today, I'm sure. And I hope you will come back again and give us some more of your wisdom. This is not working.